Well, if you're new here at Kara City, I'm Nathan Reimer. I'm the lead pastor here, and we're glad you're here this morning. A couple of weeks ago, I read an article that the Chinese government is actually rewriting the Bible. It's a 10-year project. Have you guys heard about that? Yeah, well, they're rewriting the Bible to make it line up a little better with what they believe. One of the things, they think the New Testament has a little too much mercy and forgiveness and grace, and there's not enough punishment for rule violating. So one of the things they've done is they've rewritten the story where Jesus uh, forgives and saves the woman caught in adultery. You may remember that story from the Gospel of John. Jesus is there, and some religious leaders bring this woman who'd been caught in adultery, and they're going to stone her because that was a proper punishment under Jewish law for her sin. And so they're getting ready to do that, and they want to know what Jesus thinks. And Jesus looks up and says, guys, I've got every right to do what you're doing under the law, but I would suggest that the one of you that is without sin, you probably ought to be the one to throw the first rock. And the Bible says that the men, one by one, they began to drop their rocks and they walked away. And Jesus said to the lady after everybody had left, I don't condemn you either. And then he said, but go and, and sin no more. And apparently the Chinese government doesn't like that she had violated the law and she didn't get punished for it. So they've changed that story where at the end, Jesus literally picks up a rock and stones the woman himself. They've also changed some of the Old Testament because they don't like that as well. One of my favorites is they've rewritten the first of the 10 commandments that says, thou shall have no other gods before me to resolutely guard against the infiltration of Western ideology. Sounds like something the Chinese government might do, and that shouldn't surprise us too much. But this next example might catch some of you a little off guard. Have you heard of the Jeffersonian Bible? Yeah, so most people think Thomas Jefferson was a Christian, but he actually wasn't. He was something called a deist. He believed in an all-powerful God that created the universe and then just sat back and let it run and, and didn't really intervene, kind of like a, a, a clockmaker might make this clock and wind it up and then just let it run. And, and so because of that, he didn't believe in any intervention from God. So he didn't believe in the deity of Jesus because that would be God intervening into our lives. He didn't believe in any miracles. And so what he did is he literally took a sharp knife and began to cut out the passages in his Bible that he didn't like and agree with. And you can actually see a picture of what that looked like, where he's literally just excised little passages that he didn't agree with. It, he went further than just ignoring those passages. He actually cut them out of his Bible. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to the Old Testament book of Numbers chapter 20. We're in the middle of our Wanderer series where we've been walking through the Israelites leaving Egypt, escaping from Egypt, and going all the way to the promised land. And we'll talk about them entering the promised land next Sunday, and I'm really excited about that. But in week one, we talked about how God led the people out of Egypt, and he parted the Red Sea and, and killed the entire uh, Egyptian army uh, without anyone even picking up a sword. And then the next week, we talked about how God provided for his people in the desert with manna and quail and provided for them. And then the third week, we talked about how Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And while he was up there, the, the Jewish people, they made a golden calf to worship, and they made an idol. And then last week, we talked about how they're camped right outside the promised land. And God said, this is your land. Go, go in, move in, take it. And so they sent 12 men in to scout out the land to see what it looked like. And those scouts came back, and they said, it really is an amazing land. But 10 of the 12 scouts, they came back and they said, but there, there's some big people that live there. We're really concerned about those people. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't go. And so the Jewish people just decide they're not going to enter the promised land. Well, you can imagine God wasn't very happy about that because he had provided for them. They had seen his miracles and he's now giving them that land. So he lets them go back out into the desert for 38 more years. And that's where we pick up our story today. They're actually back camped just outside the promised land again in the exact same place 38 years later. And that's where we pick up our story in Numbers 20, verse 1. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried. So they're back at Kadesh where they were 38 years ago that we talked about last week. They're camped, but then something important happens. A very important person in their community dies. Miriam is Moses' sister, 
and she dies and they bury her. Why is that significant? The significance of that is, if you remember from last week, God's punishment was that he was not going to let them enter the promised land until the entire unbelieving generation that were in leadership had died off. And what we see here is, is Moses' own family wasn't accepted from that punishment. They were part of that. And you might think, well, that, that seems a little odd. You know, Moses, Moses was the leader. He'd done a whole lot to lead Israel. He'd put up with a lot of frustration and difficulty. He's the grand poobah of what's going on. Why wasn't he accepted out? But God's punishments don't work that way. And, and I think that's important for us to understand. You know, so often I'll talk to people that will think they kind of have some special circumstance where God's rules don't really apply to them. One of those is where I'll talk to a couple that's living together that isn't married, and they'll say, you know, Pastor, we've, we've prayed about this, and we know that God is okay with what we're doing because we love one another, and we're just not in a place right now that it makes sense for us to get married, but we know God is okay. Here's the problem with that. If there wasn't an exception for Moses, who was the leader of God's chosen people, who is one of the very few people who has seen God face to face and didn't die, if there's no exception for him, there's no exception for us either. See, we don't, we don't like to talk a lot about the justice of God. We, we prefer to talk about the love of God, and we should talk about the love of God, and we talk a lot about the love of God because his love is beyond even our ability to understand it. But we also have to remember that he is not just a God of perfect love, he's also a God of perfect justice. And so we have to talk about this because here's what happened. He made us to have a relationship with him, to be obedient to him, to follow after him. He created us and then we kind of went our own way, did our own things. And every one of us have done that. We're, and the good news, I guess, is that we're all in this together. We've all fallen short of God's perfect plan for our lives, and that's called sin. Look at the way Paul says this in Romans 3.23 in his letter to the church in Rome. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us have fallen short. We, we have fallen short of God's perfect plan. And, and so then the question is, what's the punishment for that? What is the punishment for that sin? Look at Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal li life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We love the second part of that verse. We like to talk a lot about the second part. But to understand the second part, we've got to talk a little bit about the first part. Just like Miriam was part of that generation that God allowed to die off before they could enter the, the promised land, God is a God of justice, and the penalty for sin is death. We've all committed the crime. We all stand guilty as charged, but we all know that there's some really good news coming. If you've, John 3, 16, we all know it, and it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. And, and so we have this beautiful picture of God being a perfect God of justice and a perfect God of love. Jesus stood in our place. He faced the wrath of a righteous God, the Father, and he paid the penalty of our sin so that we don't have to. God's justice requires that there be a penalty of sin. He can't undo that. He's holy. But God's love meant that God actually stepped in our place and took that punishment for us. And so this, the cross is such a beautiful picture of seeing both God's perfect love and his perfect justice all working together. I talked to a guy a few weeks ago that was in a pretty bad place in his life. He, his wife had died a few years earlier, and he was struggling with some health issues and some financial troubles, and he was angry at God, and he was just real honest. He said, you can pray for me, but I don't really want you to, and that's so why I talked to him, and he said, he said look, I, I'm good with Jesus, and I'm good with the Holy Spirit, but I'm angry at God the Father. How could God the Father turn his back on his son while he was on the cross? And I explained that the cross is actually this beautiful picture of God entering judgment, but then God turning around and paying for that judgment. His great love was on full display. God the Father turned his back on Jesus so that he didn't have to turn his back on us. Jesus was rejected so that we can be accepted. 
And, and look, I, I can't fully explain or even really understand the complexities of our God. We, we wor worship a God that is one God made up of three parts, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's where we get the word Trinity from, is that idea of this God that is one but three. I can't explain that. I don't fully understand it. But here's what that means. God issued the judgment, but God also took the punishment. Jesus went willingly to the cross because he loved us that much. But we cannot miss this truth that we don't talk about probably as often as we should, that God is both loving and just. Look back at Numbers 20, verses 2 through 5. Now, there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron, so they're pretty unhappy with their leaders. They quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Now, remember from last week, what do we see the Israelites doing? complaining and upset that the promised land that had grapevines and all these things they wanted was a little too scary. So they walked away, and for 38 years they've wandered around, and now they're complaining that they don't have what the promised land would have provided. And they're a little short on water, and so they begin to grumble and complain. And, and notice that some of them said, we should have died with the rest of the generation. What you've seen is that older generation has already begun to die off, and the ones that aren't dead think they'd be better off dead as well. Man, I think about how frustrating it must have been to be Moses. Can you just imagine leading this group of people that are constantly complaining, constantly doubting? God does these amazing miracles, provides for them, and yet they fuss and they complain and they doubt. So look at what Moses does in verse 6. Moses and Aaron, who was the other leader, went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting, and they fell face down and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. So Moses and Aaron understand this is a big deal. There's a generation that has been grumbling and complaining. The judgment of God has come down that they can't enter the promised land. But now the complaining is starting to affect the younger generation. And, and they know they've got a problem. So they go and they fall face down understanding that this is a big deal before the Lord. And the Lord shows up. And, and I want you to notice in this next verse what God does. The Israelites are unfaithful but look at the faithfulness of God. Then the Lord said to Moses, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So God says, despite all of that, I'm gonna take care of my people. And so he gives Moses some very specific instructions of how to handle this situation. But Moses was pretty upset. He was angry at the people and so at that point, he decides that God hadn't put maybe quite enough drama into the moment. So he, adds, he decides he's going to add a little theatrics in his anger. And look, look at what happens. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he had commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and he struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. These were the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. So God gives him very specific instructions about how to handle this situation, but he's angry and he decides he needs to add a little emphasis and so he doesn't follow God's instructions. But boy, that seems like a harsh penalty. Right? I mean, all he did was strike the rock a couple of times and, and call them rebels. That's all he did. And God says, okay, you now are also in the judgment. You won't live to see the promised land. Boy, that feels harsh to us. And, and I think about, I love how verse 12 and verse 13 work together. Verse 12 says, God's talking to Moses and he said, you didn't honor me as holy by your disobedience. But then verse 13 says, the Lord was proven holy among them. The reality of God is he will be proven holy in our obedience because our obedience and submission to him shows that holiness. But God will also be holy through our disobedience, through his correction and judgment. And that's what happens here 
to Moses. Even though Moses didn't follow God's command, God still provides water for his people. But Moses is punished for his pride because he decided that he knew better than God how to handle this situation. In this moment, Moses broke the very first of those Ten Commandments that he brought down from Mount Sinai. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. See, Moses elevated himself to the level of God. He decided God needs his help to decide exactly what's best in that situation. Moses dishonored God, but in the end, God was still proven holy. And the same thing happens for us today. See, we, we so often want to be the God of our own world. We, we want to control and decide what happens to us, and we don't want to submit to God. We want to kind of change things up that we don't really like. But when we do that, that's the sin of pride. Do you know the sin that I think is probably most serious, the one God hates the most? It's not the one we talk about the most in church, but I think the Bible's pretty clear. Pride. Look at just a couple of verses of what the Bible has to say about pride. This is the Old Testament in Proverbs 16, 5. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Then look a few verses later in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, a hearty spirit before a fall. And look at, look at what James, the half-brother of Jesus, says about this in the New Testament in James 4, 6. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. I don't know that I want God detesting me or opposing me, but that's what happens when we have this sin of pride because he sees it as arrogance. Those three verses, that's just a little, little piece of what the Bible has to say about this sin of pride. Here's how we kind of mess this up. When we hear what God has to say about how we're to think, how we're to speak, how we're to live our lives and relate to one another, and we go, yeah, God, I, I get that, but I, I've got some other ideas. Here's really what we're saying. God, look, I get that you've been around 100 billion years, and I get that you made 100 billion trillion stars, and I, like, I get all of that, and I get that you're the creator of everything, and uh, that you're big, and you've been running this world for thousands of years, and you made me, but... But God, you're, uh, because you're omniscient, because you know everything, you know I've been around for almost 55 years. And I'm not a stranger to building stuff myself. I build some things up. And, and so, God, I don't think you're right when it comes to marriage or sex or divorce or the sanctity of human life or generosity or sharing my faith or serving. I think I know what's best for me better than you do. Like, do you hear how goofy that sounds when I say it out loud? <laughs> you may not use those same words, but that's what you're telling God when you choose to modify what he has to say to fit your perspective. We need to constantly remind ourselves that there is one God and it isn't me. Can I, can I let you in on a little secret? If your God agrees with all your views on politics, on social issues, on your personal life and the way you live and treat people, you're not worshiping the God of the universe. But here's what's cool about what you worship. <laughs> if you look in the mirror in the morning, you get to see your God facing you. But it's an idol. Every bit as much an idol as that golden calf was that the Israelites made. That is not the God of the universe. If your God agrees with you on everything, you are not worshiping the God of the universe. Let me, let me do my best to describe the God of the universe, and this is going to be woefully short of his beauty and majesty. We worship a God who is the Alpha and the Omega. In other words, the beginning, the end. Always was, always will be. The universe cannot contain him. He's too big for it. Time and space cannot even contain him. He is bigger than all of that. The sunsets you like to watch and take picture of, he painted that. The waves you like to hear crash on the shore, he runs those. The mountains you like to look at and ski down, he built those. The stars you look up and wonder at in the sky, he owns every single one of those. And a billion trillion others that you can't even see. He knows everything about you. He knows every thought you've ever thought. That's God. That's the God we worship. This almighty God created you. 
And then he gave us this instruction manual, this owner's manual called the Bible, where he tells us what's best for us and how to live. And and look, doesn't it make sense that the manufacturer, the creator of us, ought to be able to give us a book, just like Ford would if you buy a Ford car, gives you a book that tells us how things work best. And if we understand the power and the divinity of God, then we ought to submit to his will even when we don't understand it, even when we don't agree with it. Listen to how God says this in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. He tells us this. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is saying, look, I've been around a lot longer than you have. I know how you work. I made you, and we can submit to that, even when we don't understand, even when we don't agree. Submission isn't really submission when you agree with what you're told to do. It's not submitting. You're just doing what you think's right anyway. Submission is only true submission when you do something you don't understand because you're told to or you do something you don't like or agree with when you're told to. I will sometimes say it this way. If you just happen to be following another car down the road because you're both headed the same place, you're not following that car. You just happen to be on the same road. It's only true following when you're following after someone or something and you don't know where you're going or you don't like the destination. That's submission, and that's what it looks like to submit to Jesus. We're giving up completely our will for his perfect will. But but so often, that's not what we do. Because we got Satan and he whispers in our ear, hey, hey, does the Bible really say that? I mean, it kind of looks like it says that, but... There's probably got to be another explanation for that. Why don't we just cut that part out? And look, who's God to tell you what to do anyway? God gave you a mind to think, so think. You just do what sounds best to you. But do you know that's the exact same lie that Satan told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden about the fruit? He said, hey, are are you sure God really said that if you ate it, it would cause death? Wouldn't it be cool to no good and evil the way God does. Maybe you ought to give that a try. And and so Adam and Eve went their own way, and they messed it up for all of us. But the reality is, if if they hadn't messed it up, I would have. And if I didn't, you would. But when we do that, when we go our own way, and we think we're a better God than the God who created the universe, that's pride. We're breaking the very first commandment, the one that Moses broke, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm going to say something that might surprise some of you. You make a terrible God. There's not a good one. I make a terrible God. And I know because I've tried. I I tried to be my own God for about 20 years, and it didn't go so well for me. I I was called to preach when I was a teenager, and I wanted to go to law school and practice law, and I couldn't decide if I wanted to follow my plan or God's plan and so I went to college, and I took a job as a, uh, a student pastor at a small church. Things went pretty well for a while, but then the deacons and the preachers started getting upset with one another, and they wanted me to choose sides. I wouldn't choose sides, and so the deacons got upset with me, too, that I wouldn't take their side. And so I resigned from that position, and I used that bad experience to decide to be my own God. I'm just going to go my own way. And so I went to law school, and I practiced law, and for 20 years, I was my own God. And I really messed things up. I almost lost my relationship with my wife. My relationship with my kids wasn't all that good. My relationship with God was not good. My job, my career, that's all I cared about. It was my idol. It was my God. And really, I I was my God. And then about 16 years ago, my wife was diagnosed with lupus. And man, that was a sudden wake-up call for me. Because I realized I may have to spend part of my life without the wife that I loved. And it was a reminder to me that there's one God, and it isn't me. I I don't have the power to make stars, but what was so devastating for me is I also didn't have the power to even make my wife's pain go away or stop her hurting. And it was a reminder to me that there's one God, and it's not me. 
And, and so I began to transition, and I decided I want to be closer to God. I want to be closer to my family, and I began to work at that. And now I work almost full-time at a law firm, and I'm your pastor. And between all of that, I work a lot, and I love every minute of it. I could not be more happy because what I've learned is when I let God be God, and I'm me, and follow after God, I understand the beauty of his plan. Look, I don't always get it right. I mess up every single day in some form or fashion. But there's a big difference between following after Jesus and stumbling and falling and not really trying to follow Jesus. Some of you guys think following Jesus means coming to church once a week and then going right back to living life the same way you did before. There's nothing in the Bible that says that's following Jesus. If we are a follower of Jesus, we graciously and lovingly accept his rules for our life, even when we don't understand them, even when we don't agree with them. If God is big enough to build those stars and do things we can't even fathom, then he's big enough for us to trust, even when it doesn't make sense to us. And, you know, I, I think one of the biggest areas where we've messed this up as a society is in the area of sexual sin. And the reason is we just really don't like what the Bible has to say about it. And so I've had so many people tell me, look, the, the Bible is, you know, it's 2,000 years old, the New Testament, and it really doesn't translate well into our modern culture. I, I've heard preachers and teachers try to kind of ignore the Old Testament entirely and little, look at little sections of the New Testament in a different way to try to modernize the Bible. But when we do that, that's arrogance. We are submitting our will over the God of the universe's will and perspective. See, when we say those things, that the Bible was outdated, we're saying that the God who made a billion trillion stars wasn't smart enough to write down some words that would still be relevant to us today. We somehow think God needs our help updating his old ancient book, but he doesn't because he's God and we're not. It's the sin of pride. The Bible is clear, we just don't like what it has to say. We're, we're second-guessing God based on our 20 or 40 or 60, 80 years of experience on this earth. What could be more arrogant than thinking you know better than the maker of us how God's children work? Think about that. As churches and Christians, we've allowed tolerance of sexual sin to invade our society. It's become so commonplace that it can be considered hate speech to talk about certain sexual sins or the sanctity of human life. We've allowed sex to become so commonplace on TV and the internet. And look, I'm not just talking about pornography. I'm talking about commercials and movies and video games that we've become numb to it. It doesn't even phase us anymore. We wonder why our daughters are being objectified for their looks. We wonder why they're being sexualized by society. We wonder why our children are at risk, even from people that we know, even in churches, from being vi victimized. We see all of that, and yet we are numb to the, what's causing it. We aren't offended by the normalization of perverse sexual relationships and fetishes. See, we've somehow confused loving other people with cheering on the sins they're committing. And, and those are two completely different things. We ignore God's command that sex is intended only for the context of a marriage between one man and one woman. See, we, we think we know better than God, even as we look and see the devastation of sexual sin all around us. We see it in the world. I, I can't tell you how many marriages that I've seen destroyed or almost destroyed by the sins of adultery and pornography. I've counseled with those couples and seen the hurt. I, I've seen so many women who are devastated and have guilt 40 years after they had an abortion. I, I, I've counseled with people who were victimized as children and their lives have never been the same. I, I've talked to people who experienced sexual harassment in the workplace and I've seen the hurt and the devastation that causes. The whole Me Too movement came out of that. And yet we see all of that and we still think we know better than God on how things should work. God isn't being a killjoy when he talks about the proper place for human sexuality. He's not trying to destroy our fun. He gave us a powerful gift that's intended not to just create joy for a few moments, but to create joy and happiness for a lifetime. 
He knows how our brains work way better than we do. He has a complete understanding of the impact of his powerful gift that he gave us. I think sex is like the gift of fire. You know, fire in its proper place brings warmth and light. But if fire gets out of the proper context, it brings hurting and destruction and sometimes even death. Sexual sin works the same way. The beauty of this gift of sex in its proper context creates joy and happiness. It bonds a husband and wife together for a lifetime through thick and thin. It's intended to have this beautiful purpose. But outside that context, it brings hurt and pain and even death. That's why he put the limitations on sex that he did. But we come along with our vast human experience and we say, God, that that, that doesn't work anymore. I don't think that makes sense in our culture because we've evolved to a different place. That's arrogance. God doesn't need my help with his rules. He doesn't need your help either. There's one God and it isn't me. There's one God, and it isn't you. Look, I get that I'm making some of you uncomfortable. I get that. I get that some of you are probably a little irritated at me right now. But we have to talk about this, because what's happening as the church ignores these things is we've become just as victimized as the world around us by this sin, and we've become just as corrupted by it. That was not the plan God had for his world. Let's be clear. We're all broken people. We have all failed in this area of sexual sin. Every single one of us have have fallen because Jesus says if you even look at someone lustfully, you're a part of them. There's forgiveness. There's grace. There's mercy. And we all need that. But there is a difference between messing up and thinking you know better than God how his plan should work. I think about this kind of like a a little ant standing beside a big two-story house, looking up at that house going, I don't like the architectural design of this thing. It's all concrete. There's no windows or doors. It's just a straight wall. Well, the the ant's seeing that high on the slab. He has no ability to critique the architectural design because he doesn't understand it. And we are in the same place when it comes to God. But yet... We use our limited understanding to want to change. Look, I I use sex as an example because I think it's a huge issue for our world and for our churches. But then this applies to almost everything. What about being generous? The Bible is so clear that we're to be generous back to God and we're to be generous with other people around us. And and, and yet we, we don't be generous back to God through the church and we are not generous with the people around us because, well, first of all, we just, we're not, We don't have enough faith in God to believe he can take care of us even if we're generous in that way. And besides, we don't really like people telling us how to use our money. But we're missing out that God is trying to grow our faith, to trust him, just like the Israelites. Trust me. Trust in me. Even when it seems a little uncomfortable, trust me. We're also missing out on his plan to use the generosity of the church to impact the world around us so people are drawn to the church and drawn to God so their lives and their eternities can be changed. We don't share our faith with others, even though we have so many instances where we're told to do that. The Great Commission, one of the very last commands Jesus gave us before he went back to heaven, and yet we go, you know what, that's really the pastor's job to share their faith, and I don't really want to invite people to church because that might make me a little uncomfortable. It might cause a little problem. We're told and we know we're to live lives of sacrifice to God and others. And yet we bowled all that down and said, you know what a life of sacrifice looks like is I'm going to go to church for an hour on Sunday and then I'm going to go back to my life. That isn't Christianity. There's nothing about the, devi- the Bible that defines following Jesus like that. We are called to so much bigger than that. We are called to a relationship, a personal relationship with the God of the universe, that creator God that I'm talking about. We're called to be part of a church movement that transforms the world around us. That's what we're called to. That's the command. We're called to submit to God's will in the way that we think, the way we speak, the way we interact with others, and the way we interact with him. And we do that because of what was done for us. 
Look at how the Apostle Paul says this in his letter to the church in Rome. This is Romans 12, 1 through 2. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I, I love that this starts out with the word, therefore. Therefore is a big word in the Bible. It's telling us that what comes next is caused by what comes before. And usually when you see therefore in the Bible, you can just look back a few verses or maybe a couple of chapters and see the, what, why we're supposed to do something, the, the cause for the effect. But here you have to look at the first 11 chapters of Romans to see what drives the therefore. And what we see in that is what we were talking about at the beginning of the sermon. God made us to have relationship with him, to be his children, to be obedient to him. And yet we ignored that. We go our own way. We do our own thing. We made ourselves our own God. And for that, there's punishment. But God loved us so much that he sent himself. He sent his only son to pay the punishment of that sin so that we could have a right relationship with God when we follow him through our belief. Therefore, because of that mercy, because of that grace, therefore, live your lives as a holy and pleasing sacrifice to God. The Bible says, don't conform to the world. What does the world do? Makes itself their own God. I know better. I know how to do this. That's conforming. Instead, it says, be transformed by God. Be transformed by what you understand that God has done. Be transformed into thinking and understanding that God is right, even when we don't understand it. When you start to view things through this lens of God's power and might, you start to understand a little better, and his will for your life becomes more clear. See, Moses messed up with the sin of pride. He thought he knew the way to do things better than God, and it cost him. He, he didn't get to go lead his people into the promised land. Now, next week, we're going to talk about how the Israelites go into the promised land with Moses, and I'm really excited about that sermon. But it took the Israelites 38 years longer than it should have because of their lack of obedience. And all along the way, they caused problems for themselves and messed things up. Not much has changed. We still want to go our own way. We still want to do things that make sense to us. And along the way, we make a big old mess of these things because we are not good gods. Don't buy into Satan's lie that you know better than the God of the universe how things ought to work. Don't conform. Be transformed. Be transformed into a follower who submits their will completely to Jesus Christ and who chases after him with their thoughts and their actions and their words. There is only one God, and it isn't me. Let's pray.